Aloha, and welcome back to Politics in Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii with Dennis Issa. Today, we'll be speaking with Ed Case, our senior, con senior congressman from Hawaii. His work for Senator Spark Masunaga, he has been in the state legislature as a majority leader, is representing Congressional District 2 in Congress before, and now representing uh, CB1, which is urban Hawaii. He graduated from Hawaii Prep Academy and is an attorney. But we won't hold that against him. He has received many awards, such as the Legislator of the Year and Elected Official of the Year before. Ed has stood up for what he thought was right. In the meantime, we find out that he, he was right. Ed, welcome to the show. Please tell us about politics in Congress more particularly on the division on issues between party lines. Ed? Well, aloha, Dennis. First of all, um, it's great to be with you and all of all of your listeners. I, I, I like to come on Think Tech Hawaii as much as I possibly can. Uh, first time with you, and I look forward to our discussion. Well, you know, I'm uh, sitting here in Congress, of course. Uh, behind me on the screen is Congress in action. I just came from the whole house uh, for, for a vote, and the vote is going on. And so um, I'm on the Hill uh, doing my constitutional duty. Um, of course, there's always going to be tension uh, in Congress <clears throat> when different uh, policy perspectives are presented uh, for members of Congress to, to vote on. And members of Congress are very passionate, as are the constituents that we serve, and as is the country. And so we do have divisions, and there's nothing unusual about uh, differences in, in approach, differences in policy. We have to find some way to resolve those in, in a democracy, and, and that's what our Congress is, is set up to do. Um, the difficulty comes when it becomes about much more than just resolving differences in policy, when it becomes um, a, a win-all game uh, that is focused uh, purely and simply on the politics of the moment, not on the long-term benefit of the country, uh, when it is focused on um, um, tearing down your opponent, uh, credit, uh, discrediting your opponent, um, acting as if those uh, concerns are not valid and refusing to look for a uh, consensus of uh, concerns that may represent the mainstream of our country. And that's exactly what we have way too much of uh, in Washington, D.C. right now. We have major issues across the board. Uh, I can name just for a few uh, immigration. Uh, we, we have a broken immigration system. I think we might all agree on that. I think we might all agree that our federal budget is in dire straits. I think we might all agree um, that, that our infrastructure needs upgrading. I think we might all agree uh, that China presents a, a, a threat to our country um, and to our world. We might well agree on lots of things. Um, and within uh, that agreement is the kernel of, of agreement also on what to do about it. But not if your goal is simply to deny the other side of victory at any cost and that your uh, perspective is the be all and end all and and either you get 100% or 0%, and you really just don't uh, want to work with anybody else in Congress, or especially the other party. And so my, my real challenge here in Congress um, is, is um, I guess I would say, um, three or fourfold rising out of the same basic problem, which is, how do you get anything done in a very dysfunctional uh, Congress like any organization? Well, first of all, you have to find your friends. You have to find um, your, your um, uh, folks that you can work with on any one issue, you have to try to listen to what they have to say. You have to see if you can solve their problem while solving your own problem. Um, yes, you have to compromise sometimes, uh, and you have to do it for the good of the country, uh, not because um, you know, necessarily want to. I mean, we all probably think we're right in some way, shape, or form, but um, there's a lot of people in this country that all think they're right. And if we don't find some way to uh, listen and, and um, uh, adjust to other people's perspectives, um, it's a very hard road. So, um, it, that is my focus here. Um, interestingly, on many occasions, it is possible to actually achieve that. For example, I'm a member of the Appropriations Committee, which is uh, the Committee of Congress that is responsible for virtually all uh, discretionary spending. So the year-to-year -year spending, some $1.4, $1.5 trillion. And during COVID-19, we were responsible also for some $4 to $5 trillion of emergency assistance. And within that Appropriations Committee, you find a lot of people that are willing to work together to to produce our annual uh, bills and to produce our our our, our spending uh, priorities, we 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 try to accommodate everybody in that committee and reach mainstream consensus solutions. Yes, we disagree on some things, but we usually do it politely and civilly. Um, but it's not true in other parts of our 
uh, political discourse in there. I just have to navigate uh, carefully. And of course, um, that is all uh, with, re with respect to national issues. And I have to get done for Hawaii what Hawaii needs to get done. And I need to work with everybody uh, to get that done, especially a very, very small delegation in a very, very big pool. And so that requires maintaining relationships and helping people where you can uh, and and uh, trying to um, trying to ask for their help where you need their help. As, as, <laughs> along the lines, uh, you've been called a leader in the Blue Dog Coalition. What does that mean? Well, in co in Congress, um, again, there's 435 members of the U.S. House and there's 100 uh, senators, and so that's 535 voting members of, of Congress. And um, in our congressional delegation in Hawaii, we have four members, two senators, two representatives. So we're four out of 535. So when you do that math, it's pretty easy to figure out that you've got to work with other people uh, that have your common interests. Sometimes um, you work with people in your own party, uh, and sometimes you work across the aisle, and sometimes you do all of the above. Uh, and uh, much of the way we do that um, is in our committees. I already talked about the appropriations of committee. Uh, my other committee is the Natural Resources Committee with jurisdiction over all of our nation's uh, uh, public lands and, and waters, as well as our indigenous peoples to include Native Hawaiians. Uh, but we also have what we refer, refer to as caucuses, uh, which are our collections of members of Congress united around a common purpose. So, for example, we have, we have a, uh, um, a U.S.-Japan caucus. Uh, that I'm a member of and always have been. That is because I care a lot about the relationship between the United States and Japan. Uh, we have, um, you know, we have um, the, the similar caucuses, the, the Oceans Caucus. Uh, that's a pretty uh, obvious one as well. Uh, the Blue Dog Caucus or coalition, but it's essentially a caucus, is, is a group of Democratic uh, representatives uh, who are, are focused uh, primarily on the fiscal stability of our country, the budgetary, the monetary stability of our country. We worry a lot about massive uh, federal deficits and debt and what to do about that. We're also focused very much on our national defense and our national security. Uh, so we take, we take very realistically and eyes wide open uh, the threats around our world, such as Russia and China. Uh, we take uh, very realistically and, and uh, uh, eyes wide open that um, that we have to have a strong national defense and national security to uh, try to work with the other countries of the world to ensure um, the international peace that we have mostly had for three generations against that kind of uh, um, uh, opponents and aggressions. And then finally, we are focused on getting things done. Um, so we're focused on pragmatic uh, uh, results-oriented solutions. And so um, we're not adverse to working across the aisle uh, where we need to do to get this done. So we're not really partisan in terms of how we approach things. And so that caucus uh, tends to represent um, a slice of the Democratic caucus. Um, and we band together so that we can act collectively towards those ends. Um, uh, so that, that's the Blue Dog uh, Coalition. Um, it is, it is a, a, I guess I would call it a moderate mainstream coalition, but um, in all honesty, to, 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 to call it a day with me just on the basis of uh, being in that coalition is a little bit of a mistake because um, I have other uh, interests and other caucuses and other uh, perspectives um, um, in terms of my approaches to other issues, for example, the environment, uh, and go on in other areas where I may not always agree with my Blue Dog uh, colleagues. But on those issues, fiscal responsibility, national defense, and uh, results-oriented legislation, we generally do agree, and so we try to help each other. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. You have long talked about and fought for repealing the Jones Act. Can you please explain? Well, the Jones Act is the uh, federal law, um, it, so it, it governs the entire country, um, that was enacted over 100 years ago now. In fact, it's just over 100 years of, uh, since uh, the anniversary of the Jones Act, one century. So a different time, a different place, a different world. Um, and what the Jones Act basically says in so many words is that uh, when uh, uh, <laughs> goods are shipped between two U.S. ports, they must use U.S. built shipping flagged, uh, i.e. licensed in the United States and accrued by U.S. Uh, um, um, basically U.S. citizens. Um, and 
Perhaps that made sense 100 years ago uh, when there were just a ton of ships out there, uh, including a ton of shipbuilding capacity in the United States and a ton of Jones Act ships in the United States. And because we had so many Jones Act ships, the law was not a problem in, in, in respect to its basically restricting any cargo uh, shipments be, to, to U.S. ships uh, because they had to compete with each other. Uh, and so the, the, the difference between the price of shipping on Jones Act ships and the price of shipping on, on a ship that you could hire in the international market was not materially different. Uh, today, that's a far different story. Uh, we have very little shipbuilding capacity in our, our country. We're down to less than 100 Jones Act ships, and they carry all the cargo between U.S. Uh, ports. So, for example, obviously, um, Oakland to Honolulu, which is our primary uh, you know, uh, entry for, for, for 80, 90 percent plus of all of our goods in Hawaii, you know, lumber, milk, um, um, you name it. Um, you know, unless it's produced in Hawaii, it usually comes in by the Jones Act. Now, that's a problem because what that creates is monopolies. Um, and in fact, we do have a virtual monopoly on that shipping lane between California and Hawaii uh, because we only have two Jones Act shippers that transit that. And let's, let's not be surprised uh, that their prices um, go up in sync. Uh, so they're both making far more on that transit than if those ships were non-Jones Act ships in the international market. Now, what makes the Jones Act particularly uh, devastating to Hawaii is that we have no alternative uh, to that uh, shipment. First of all, as I already said, we get most of our goods um, uh, from, from uh, shipments from California. Um, and second, we do not have an alternative um, if that price uh, of that shipping and that transshipment uh, gets too high. So, so um, you know, we can't, we can't uh, you know, truck it in instead. We can't train it in instead. We can't do cheap airplanes in instead. We're capped uh, to two shipping companies, and they take full advantage of that. Um, and I've concluded uh, from a policy perspective that that is unacceptable, that that is harmful uh, to the people of Hawaii in significantly higher prices across the board. Um, impacting housing, uh, you know, food, um, you know, garden goods, um, uh, agriculture, ranching, I could name any number of industries all impacted uh, by the Jones Act to include, by the way, uh, our workers um, in, 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 our, in our labor industries who pay substantially higher uh, amounts uh, as a result of the Jones Act. And so um, I have opposed the Jones Act for quite a while. And as you can imagine, uh, the folks that have a monopoly over that uh, and have a lot of money to make from that, they very much oppose me. Uh, and so they don't like me talking like this. Uh, however, I think it's important for me to highlight that uh, I have introduced uh, measures in Congress to repeal the Jones Act as it impacts Hawaii and the other island parts of our country, non-contiguous, I can put it that way. So not the mainland, in other words. So Alaska, Puerto Rico, um, you know, Guam, et cetera. Um, and I've also introduced bills that say, if you're not going to repeal the Jones Act, then at least uh, regulate the cost of that shipping so that you take the monopoly premium out of it and you essentially link the cost to the international market. So in other words, they don't, they don't, get, to, they don't get to gouge us because they have a monopoly. Does that refer to the cruise ships too? The, there is a there is a similar uh, bill um, that is called the Passenger Vessel Services Act, and that is essentially the Jones Act for passenger vessels. Um, and it's quite topical, as a matter of fact, because um, let's let's say let's say that you are a um, um, a, a a a cruise liner um, who wants to take passengers from Seattle to Alaska, so the Alaska cruise, right? Um, now, the way that they work that, um, they, can, they can do that on, on, on U.S. flagged passenger vessels, of which there are very, very few, by the way, same situation as the Jones Act. Uh, but if they are foreign vessels, then they have, to take a, they have to make a stop somewhere along the way. And that's what they do. They leave Seattle, they stop in Canada, uh, and then they go on to Alaska because they're not going directly between Seattle and Alaska. They're not subject to that law. Now, what happened in, in the middle of COVID-19 was Canada shut down. And so that industry completely dried up. 
And as a result, um, the passenger vessel, the, the cruise line companies who are American companies using foreign vessels, they went out there and just obtained an exception uh, to the Passenger Vessel Services Act that allows them uh, to take foreign uh, vessels directly from Seattle to Alaska, at least as long as COVID-19 is around. So that'll indicate to you. Similarly, uh, we saw recently um, disruption in, in, in some of our uh, you know, natural gas uh, for, for various reasons. A lot of the natural gas is shipped um, on, on um, uh, you know, shipped around on, on non-Jones Act uh, ships, and that was, that was disrupted and a waiver was granted. Uh, so that um, that market could could continue. So I guess that the lesson of all of that is the Jones Act works until it doesn't work, and then you get an exception to it. Well, it doesn't work for four. Okay, uh, we're halfway through. Why don't we take a short break? Thank you for calling. Uh, we'll be right back. I think that could wait. Aloha, I'm Mitch Ewan, host of Hawaii, the state of clean energy on ThinkTech Hawaii. Hawaii, the state of clean energy is about following the many clean energy initiatives in Hawaii. Hawaii, the state of clean energy appears weekly on ThinkTech Hawaii at 4 p.m. on Wednesdays. Thank you so much for watching our show. We'll see you then, aloha. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii with Ed Case. Uh, Ed, um, some have said you voted against one of the COVID relief bills. Can you please explain that? Well, that's incorrect, first of all. Um, you know, people that uh, um, uh, don't, don't particularly like some of my votes um, say things that it simply aren't true, and they, that, that's politics today. You hang it out there and because you say it, people start to believe it. Um, the fact of the matter is that I voted for every COVID-19 uh, re uh, relief bill uh, since March of last year. Um, so that was the CARES Act, uh, which was um, a, a major, the first major bill uh, of three major bills uh, that started us uh, down the road towards some, some critical federal relief. I supported that, I voted for it, and I implemented it. Um, and that yielded um, significant amounts of money to, to Hawaii. Also voted for um, the emergency assistance bill in, at the end of last year, uh, which was another almost $1 trillion. And then finally, I voted for the American Rescue Plan just a few um, uh, months ago, uh, which is the bill that's in effect right now. Uh, when you take all of those bills together, that was almost $5 trillion worth of emergency assistance. I voted for those bills. The vote that uh, people are misconstruing was a vote uh, against a um, obscure um, procedure, which is referred to as reconciliation. And um, reconciliation in so many words um, um, for, really forecloses any possibility of, uh, of a potential um, um, uh, consensus uh, coming out, a consensus bill coming out of Congress because it essentially uh, the purpose of reconciliation really is to is to allow the majority on a, on a slim majority of one to implement the bills of that uh, size. And um, I voted against the reconciliation bill at the beginning, one of those uh, one of those larger bills uh, when we were voting on the procedure at the beginning because I felt that we had not exhausted the possibilities of trying uh, to find a consensus a solution. Um, and I felt that if I voted for reconciliation, I was essentially saying um, there's no way that we can do this. And I didn't believe that. And I didn't believe it was good for the country that we abandoned, uh, uh, abandoned that. Um, later, it became apparent that, in fact, um, the only way to get them passed was uh, to proceed by reconciliation. And so um, on the second go around, I voted for reconciliation. That's a long way of saying um, the, the basic, uh, basic statement is incorrect. Um, and the real reason uh, for, my, for, for my negative vote was that, um, again, I felt uh, that the country um, needed to try to unite around um, a reasonable package of relief. And 
relief uh, was not possible at the end of the day with that approach. And so I, I went for it. Yeah, thanks uh, very much for clarifying that. You mentioned, you know, on certain uh, subjects, there's outside influence. I'm sure it has always been there. You touch upon a little bit. Let's let's observe, first of all, that I should be subject uh, to outside influence. I mean, no member of Congress, nobody in elective office should be cut off, should be insulated, should be, um, you know, um, put on a put on the top of a tall mountain where nobody can can talk to him or her or attempt to influence him or her. I mean, um, my constituents in particular, the people that I represent, should be able uh, to try to influence me. Um, and I welcome that. I learn a lot that how can I be uh, truly representative um, if I'm not listening, if, if I'm not out there tr uh, trying to understand what people think. I don't have all the answers. Uh, I have to make the decisions, and I do make the decisions. Uh, when I when when I need to make my decisions, I make the decision. That's my job. My job is to make the decision. Um, but I can't do that in a vacuum. And so um, I welcome people walking into my office um, and talk, telling me what they think and arguing with me and even getting very, very mad at me if, if I don't agree. Um, uh, and that includes uh, people that are paid to do so. Um, and so. There's nothing per se wrong with outside influence. However, um, the, the, the sheer scope of, of um, paid outside influence on Congress now um, is, is simply overwhelming and has really uh, resulted in a very, very corrosive um, atmosphere in Congress where essentially that paid influence is starting to crowd out everybody else. You've got 1% uh, of the folks in the country basically, um, you know, influencing what happens to the other 99%. Um, and it's, 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 for, it's for a specific special interest or a tax credit for a company or for, you know, whatever it might be. And so uh, how do you control that? Well, I think there's, there's two ways uh, to control it. First of all, um, you must have absolutely full disclosure of where all of that money, all that is, of that influence is being, you know, bought and paid for. Right now, we don't have that. It is possible for somebody uh, to contribute large, large amounts of money um, to a particular um, goal uh, uh, to be implemented by paid lobbyists without anybody ever knowing who that person is. And that's not the way it has to work. We, we need to know who is trying to influence me and why are they trying to influence me and how much money are they paying to try to influence me. And then second, of course, um, if it becomes um, a, a, an influence that um, that corrodes my independent ability to make my decisions so that it becomes a quid pro quo. In other words, um, the, the, the influence is, 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 is used to purchase uh, my vote or my influence, my own influence on something. Well, that's, that's completely wrong. I think we would all agree on that. And uh, frankly, um, uh, the, the laws are not strong enough uh, to, to prevent that uh, and, and to, and to um, fully prosecute it when it does happen. Uh, sometimes it can be very, very gray what's happening. Uh, and so you've got to toughen those laws. We passed um, um, in, in uh, the first month that I came back to Congress in 2019, and again, just a few months in the current Congress, uh, HR1, uh, which is the first bill introduced in Congress. So number one bill, HR1. And we call that the For the People Act. And the For the People Act is basically us saying we're not going to take that. Uh, it is it is corrosive uh, to the country. It is it is leading uh, people to to um, uh, uh, be disgusted uh, uh, with their government generally and with their Congress specifically. Congress has uh, last I checked a ninety a twenty four percent approval rate in this country. Now, I'm not proud of that. I'm sitting here as a member of Congress, and people of our country think that. My institution that I care about and that I want to make work is rated 24%, meaning three quarters of the country doesn't think we're doing a good job. Um, that's a great concern to me. And so HR1 is an attempt to reverse that. And that's our number one priority. Um, frankly, it is um, now stymied. It passed the House. It's stymied over in the Senate. And the but reality is because the changes that, that it would uh, implement um, but remove uh, the ability of people to exert undue special influence on Congress. And so the very people that are benefiting to start with are 
very uh, committed to making sure that doesn't happen. So I hope I hope that uh, hope it prevails. Thanks. Another vote that's uh, I guess you voted against the uh, voting rights for jailed criminals. I know other congressmen voted for it. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, you know, that's one of those bills that, you know, you say it like that and, and, it, and, it, and it completely loses uh, the subtleties. The fact is that let's take um, the most extreme example. First of all, the bill that I voted against would have provided voting rights to any incarcerated felon. Any. So it doesn't matter, you know, what you were convicted of. Um, it doesn't matter what the circumstances were. Um, nothing matters. You still get the right to vote. And of course, in our country, we have followed the general principle that if you um, act contrary to, to the laws of our country, you should not, uh, you know, uh, generally be entitled to choose the direction of our country, that that is a consequence of criminal behavior. Um, now, let's take, um, let's take two examples and let's see what you think about those two examples. So what if I were to say that somebody was prosecuted when, um, you know, he was he was 21 years old um, on, a, on, a, on the second marijuana possession um, uh, offense, and he was convicted of that. Um, and um, it was a felony, and he was incarcerated. Um, and here, 20 years later or whatever, um, the question is whether he should have voting rights. Should he? I think he should. Um, I think that that is too harsh a consequence uh, for, for a law that today we look back on and ask ourselves, why were we uh, throwing people in jail for felonies on simple possession of, of some some uh, some drugs, as opposed to dealing them. Um, but let's let's um, let's let's take the other example. Let, let's let's talk about the Oklahoma bomber. He was he killed hundreds of people. He was convicted. He was sentenced. Does does he get the vote? I don't think so. Um, and so I voted against the bill because the bill said that the Oklahoma bomber could vote. And that was a, a bridge too far for me. Um, so if I had gotten a different bill, um, I probably would have voted for it. Um, but again, uh, uh, you know, um, unfortunately, um, in today's, you know, soundbite world, uh, the soundbite is as you presented it. And I need to explain it, but I'm not complaining. That's that's my job. My job is to is to talk about uh, the the um, the reasons uh, wh why I make the decisions that I do and the and the, con the the true context, even if somebody is actually trying to use it against me. Okay, we got a minute left. Uh, we got a lot more things to talk about. Thanks for being here. Uh, one more, th well, one of the many things more. Uh, I wanted to talk about how politics affects. You touched upon it a little bit on the rising prices of goods now. You say something that and have your closing statement? Well, I mean, you know, the goods are going up for a number of reasons. Number one, in Hawaii, it certainly is the Jones Act. Number two, uh, COVID-19 has certainly di uh, disturbed our, our supply chains, and, and, and so it may be temporary. Uh, but frankly, I, I don't think it's all temporary. And then number three, back to my point earlier about uh, physical stability in our country, the fact is uh, that excessive debt leads to inflation. Um, and we've seen that in countries around the world, countries like you know Greece and Argentina, who have spent too much uh, and borrowed it all. And so, um, uh, you, you know, there there are things we definitely can do about inflation, uh, but we have to first acknowledge why it's happening and 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 look in the mirror and face the music as to the changes that that need to occur uh, in order to tame inflation. It, it, it is doable, uh, but not by simply yelling and screaming at each other. And maybe that's about the best. Way I can uh, think about the end because um, if all if all politics and government is about nowadays is is simply yelling and screaming at each other across a great divide, um, then um, that's not a good future for our country. And I choose otherwise, and um, that's the way I approach my job. Um, and I I will continue I will continue to do that and hope people uh, believe as I do that that's really the only way forward. Thank you, Ed. Thank you for your service, and thank you for explaining a lot of things uh, to the people of Hawaii and the world. Uh, this concludes this uh, portion of Politics in Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii. Mahalo to Ed Pace, Congressman from Hawaii, for joining us. Aloha. 
Aloha.